Let's start, okay, folks? Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's December 7th, 2011, and this is the first of what looks like it's going to be more than one show about a book. I don't know, Monica, when it was published. This year sometime. Um, called uh, Walk Out, Walk On. The authors of which are um, Meg Wheatley and... <laughs> Oh, where are my notes here? Who's the second author? Is that? Huh? Oh, she just emailed you today, Deborah Freeze. There you go. Yeah, she just did email us today, Deborah Freeze. <laughs> anyway, sorry about that, Deborah. Um, and anyway, and Deborah may be joining us um, in the future, but um, I know that a couple of people here. Um, I think Marianne Riley and um, Anne and um, Monica Hardy have been trying to get together, wanting to get together. And, and then it seemed to me that, uh, and to others, um, and, uh, that Occupy Wall Street might be an example of what's going on. And so um, we also have with us um, Liam. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm tired tonight, I guess. Liam, your last name is O'Don O'Donnell. It's O'Donnell. Yeah, there we go. So, and people will introduce okay. themselves. And then Fred Midland is with us as well. And um, so, um, and let's kind of get started. Um, Monica, would you start us off by talking about the book a little bit? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Oh, we would never stop. <laughs> no, uh, no, start there. It came out April... It came out April 11th of this year, and um, I'm going to do what I always do when Marianne is here. She's the one that on Twitter, she was like, hey, here's a book we should probably read. And so, you know, within a few minutes, there were probably five of us wanting to read it. And I, again, I can't thank her enough because um, it's just been perfect um, for the soul. And as Fred's saying, it, it resonates with some of the stuff um, he's done. Shannon was just tweeting earlier, and she said it came at a perfect time in her life. Um, and for what we've been doing in Loveland, Colorado, our quiet revolution, it just resonates left and right, particularly with what Marianne has written about rhizomes. And um, so I'm going to give her the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Um... You know, this is the, I think this is the book that's been the slowest book I've ever read in my life. Um, mm. It's so good. And I'm curious with um, whoever else in the group has, uh, is reading it. Um, but I parcel out sections to read so that um, I can kind of make it last longer. Um, I'm still, it, it, I don't know, is everyone familiar with the book at all or... Um, a little bit. I think a little every, bit, not really. You know what yeah, I give wondered, a background, Marianne. Well, you know what I wondered. What might be nice if um, mm -hmm. Monica and Anne, if you have your book, do you have your book there with you? I just have it on Kindle. Yeah, me too. I have it on Kindle too. <laughs> because one of the nice features in Kindle is that your notes right, come up, notes like parts you've highlighted. Right. And I wonder, could we just maybe read a couple of sections that we've highlighted, little sections, just. Uh, because the book is so incredibly powerful, I think that one of the things that might be interesting is just to hear um, just, you know, a couple of really random types of, of quotes from the text. Is, would, would that work? Well, I'm not smart enough to pull those up on a Kindle, but I have put some of them in a post, so I can do that. Okay. Okay. Things that just, you know, uh, resonate. So, um, well, I said that, and then I hit, a, I hit the wrong button. Hold on a sec. <laughs> Okay, the, the first thing I um, highlighted was a, a statement that says, when certainty collapses, it is, almost, it is often replaced by curiosity. So when certainty collapses, it's often replaced by curiosity. Anne, did you have one? Um, I have, and, and I only, um, I highlighted this one because we've often referred to EdCamp as magic. So I put, this is, this is a space in which magic happens. It looks absolutely ordinary, doesn't it? That's because magic is invisible. I also highlighted that one. 
I have a couple though. I have, um, it's hard to explain something that's daily rewritten. Hmm. Um, what unites the learners is a belief that learning is practiced for the sheer joy of it rather than to acquire certification. Just, I, I, I mean, I have a bunch of them here, so I could go on and on. I love this book. And introduce yourself a little bit uh, more. You mentioned Ed Camp, and you were involved in starting that in Philadelphia. Um, yes. You're an English teacher there in Philadelphia. Um, I am. And you've been messing around with Occupy Wall Street materials and your dissenters curriculum as well. So you're sort of well, a actually, transition of some sort between the two groups here as well. But go yeah, ahead. I have yeah. kind of a little, a little bit of, um, we started at Camp Philly uh, two years ago. And it was just a group of educators that met on Twitter. We had never met anyone, either, you know, each other face to face. We went to a bar camp and we had so much fun that we thought, you know, this is, this is what we need to do for education. We need to bring this to teachers so teachers can have fun learning together. Um, and we just started tweeting it out when we started our, when we did, had our ed camp, we had about a hundred and maybe a hundred and a couple teachers, 110 maybe show up and we were, I guess it was the energy and the excitement that just kind of flew through Twitter and then they just started, you know, going viral and popping up all over, which is kind of what this, um, in the book it talks about cross, you know, cross... Translocal. Yeah, mm -hmm. translocal or, you know, going across instead of down and, mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, top down. Scale, yeah, scale, scale across up, as opposed down. to scale up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then... I don't know, everything just seemed to come together because I had to teach the dissenters to my kids. So I started out with uh, UC Davis videos um, of the kids getting pepper sprayed because I knew it would hit home with them. And and then I showed this the walk of shame where the chancellor came out and, and the, the whole campus was there in dead silence and all you could hear was her, you know, her heels clicking on the cement. <laughs> and my kids were like, I don't get it. Why don't they get up and get in her face? Um, but then I said to them, well, think about the, the impact of the silence. They had so much more power and so much more impact with that silence than they ever could have with any kind of confrontation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about nonviolence and we're talking about nonviolent resistance. And it's such a great time to teach this because it's there. It's out there every day. Every time you open, you know, the newspaper or turn on the, on the TV, it's, it's in your face. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am. I especially liked the, um, what Marianne brought up about, or maybe it was Anne, about um, you can't explain things. And we, we're taking it to mean you really can't explain anything that's alive. You know, once you explain right. it, you define it, and it's really not alive anymore. And school is based on definition and explaining right. things. So that was huge. Um, and then the whole piece about... Um, it's when you realize no one's coming to help that you become, you know, uh, free to help yourself. And I think that probably fits in. I haven't read Liam's bit, um, but that probably fits into some of the stuff he addresses. Of you know, um, yeah. it's we think it's the worst time, but and I keep thinking of Lisa Gansky's The Mash as well as I read through this whole book. It's it's when we realize to use what we already have, that again, we get that freedom and, and that empowerment. It's a, it's a good empowerment. It's, a, it's based on, I can't do this by myself, but with community, I can. You know, the correlate to that, too, is when experts come into a, um, a community and establish um, what the problem is for the community, what this book, uh, I think, so eloquently <clears throat> points out is that that method fails because mm -hmm. they're not inside. And, and then all of the local realities are oftentimes stripped from um, the situation. And, um, and, and if we extrapolate that a little bit further, we actually get entire policies in the U.S. built on the belief that, that what I just described is a great method. Um, so that if it worked, you know, if it worked, if Ed Camp, the way Ann just described it, worked in Philly, well, then everybody in America will have to do it exactly that way. And that's our whole idea of this, this scale up that, um, you know, it, it isn't about um, 
actual people in real time, um, in real places. It's about an epic construct that says, you know, we've done this someplace and we think it worked well, so now everybody's going to be subjected to it. Right. This book and really reverses that nicely. And she keeps referring to that as place-based, a place-based approach. Yes. Yeah. Right. It, it, it really is cultural. Mm -hmm. um, Jacqueline Novogratz wrote The Blue Sweater, and then Carol Black's Schooling the World both talk deeply about not stripping that culture. Mm -hmm. Right. It's yeah. funny because we're just getting into, I'm sorry, one more thing. I just wanted to jump in. The, um, we're just getting into forming the foundation for EdCamp. I mean, it's been two years that it's been going on its own. And it's such a delicate balance. I mean, we only formed the foundation so that we could support people that wouldn't have money to run their ed camps if they needed money. That's the only reason that we started it. Um, and you know, to just try to keep that going, that that excitement and that that power of learning together and playing together and just having fun. But it is such a delicate balance, even to try to form a foundation. Because when you're doing bylaws and all that stuff, it's all like legal stuff that you have to do. But we really went with the most basic that we could, you know, so we could keep it open and keep it free and keep it, you know, that it it would go on its own. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you mentioned the word play, and she she talks quite a bit about play in there as well, in very graphic and very beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, why don't we jump in to Liam's little yeah. well, Wall Street. I didn't mean to cut you off, Liam. I'd love no, to do no, that. That's great. Could, that's great. The, the three of you who are most deeply into the book, I'm, I, I'm on Kindle, too. I don't know what page I'm on. Um, I'm, somewhere in, uh, I'm somewhere in Brazil right now. Um, mm -hmm. But the, uh, what I was going to ask is if somebody could describe what the title comes from, I think that's significant. Like, what does Walk Out, Walk On mean? And then Liam will turn to you and want to ask you sort of like, now that you've heard some of these themes, how is that mm -hmm. like Occupy Toronto, which you've been involved okay. in? Somebody want to take okay, on the definitely. title? Yeah, let's hear the title. I'd like, because I would like to hear that as well. I'm curious to know what the title is. The significant I'm going to fall to Marianne again. She's the, she's the rhizome queen and she's the walking queen. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so and then I'm just going to read aloud one little section. Good, it says, good, walkouts are people who bravely choose to leave behind situations, jobs, relationships, and ideas that restrict and confine them, anything that inhibits them. They walk on to the ideas, people, and practices that enable them to explore and discover new gifts, new possibilities. So, you know... Well, why don't I just let that resonate for a minute? So people who leave behind situations, jobs, relationships, ideas that restrict and confine them. So things that maybe are overly um, definitioned, if that's actually even a verb. Um, and they walk on to ideas and people, practices that enable them to explore and discover new gifts, new possibilities. So the, you know, the idea of places that may in fact feel overly safe are places that um, the people described in this book walk out of. And um, in walking out, um, I think it's so fabulous about that, that idea is that the little comma, I think, between walk out and walk on may be the most important thing in that, in that title mm -hmm. because that's a space of pause where you're nowhere. And so you get to be almost everywhere. That's, you do see what I mean at the same time. And that, that to me was kind of interesting. Um, it's, I read that little section. Um, I mean, I had only read that when I made went on Twitter and said, "Oh, let's all read this." Right. I'm glad the book actually has lived up to um, you know far more than I even thought. But, yeah. So that's that, that idea, right? So walk out, gonna, leave behind safety. Uh, I'm going to add a little Kathy Davidson's "Now You See It" into that mix because Good. just finishing her book before this book, and she talked about going outside of yourself. And when you go outside of yourself, that's when you realize the community and you're able to see, um, you know, other people's stories and then the world becomes completely different. So mm. I, I think that's good as well. And I don't know, you guys, am I just remembering this weird? Because 
what we're doing, our movement is a connected adjacency, doing it both inside the district and outside of the district. And I could have sworn at the very beginning, I was really resonating with it. it sounded like, dang, that sounds like, I'll have to go back and look. But. No, no, it's good. I actually wrote that somewhere in this um, Kindle. There's a note from me that says, this reminds me of Monica. So um, okay. and it was in the beginning, Monica. I was, especially in the very beginning, I kept reading that. And, so that um, sentiment is, we don't have to bash everything. You know, it's, it's sometimes the best resources are on those systems that we're seemingly bashing. And it, we've got to remember that it's the people that we love. Maybe it's the system that we don't necessarily like, but the people may have changed because of that system, but we still love the people. Now, so. Hey Liam, you gotta jump in, man. Uh, well, I'm waiting. You, I mean, you know, I'm about to jump in. Go okay, ahead. Because I will, I will confess. I mean, I had not heard of this book um, until uh, Paul emailed me about it. Um, and but now hearing hearing everyone talk about it, I can immediately see the connections that it has with um, with the Occupy movement in you know in general. I mean, just this whole idea of, I mean, what, what, what they call in, in Occupy it being a horizontal structure, meaning that there is no leader. Um, and I think that speaks to what you were talking about, about how um, essentially we're, we're not in the book. I remember seeing the video about not waiting for heroes or being a host or something like that. And, and that is very much the idea that, that um, I know Occupy is trying to put forward is this idea that anyone can get involved and anyone can do what they want to help uh, move this forward um, and a lot of that does involve sort of stepping out of of your comfort zone and 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 taking some risks um, so and uh, like um, uh, in my class like what Ann was showing some of the videos I've basically been doing the same with my kids um, I teach grade five uh, up here in Toronto um, and one of the great things about grade five is in social studies you we do a whole unit on government and so we just happen to be doing a whole unit on government and part of that is is protest and social protest just as this whole occupy thing took off and so um as ann said you know if it's happening around you've got to bring it into the classroom and that's mm -hmm. that was my first steps into bringing it into the classroom was to sort of reflect you know what is actually happening in the world outside is you know especially in the city that i'm teaching in Well, it, it, you know, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ann. It's Go funny. On. It's funny that you say that, Liam, because my school is situated about two blocks from where the Occupy Philly tents were up, and you know, oh, our cool. kids, our kids walk by them every day. They were down nice. there feeding the homeless, so it wasn't something that was <laughs> even removed remotely. You know what I mean? It was there. It was in their lives every day. Mm -hmm. um, and and when we started to read Thoreau you know, something that's usually so dense and difficult for them, they completely connect to it because he talks about, you know, civil government and how you need to stand up if something's not right. And, and you know, civil how disobedience. The, right, and how the government takes over, you know, individual man. And so it, mm. it, you know, made it so much easier to teach something that usually is, you know, not that the kids always, they always connect to him because he's a rebel, you know. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been fun teaching it now. It's been it's been a lot of fun. I, I mean that's to ask. Go ahead. Sorry, go on. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead, Monica. No, 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 you go. <laughs> no, I was just I was just gonna comment that it must have been um uh it must have been pretty amazing for your kids to actually see the um to see the the camp. I mean that was one thing I would have loved to do is bring my kids down to see the Occupy Toronto camp. Um but it just wasn't possible. I mean they were you know, they're only in grade five and and so um it must have been it must have been pretty cool to have uh, the kids actually see the camp. And so, what I wanted to ask is, did you have did you have a lot of opposing views from your kids? Did you have some kids who thought that they shouldn't be doing that, or was it, you know, and kids who thought that they did? Well, it's interesting because before we started to read Thoreau, we had we were doing the colonials and we were talking about you know other things, and we were talking about um, Occupy Philly too. But the kids were, you know, they just make the city look dirty and. They, you know, because the media was really pushing that aspect of it, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, saying that they were, you know, th there was yeah. really ugly comments in our in our inquiry uh, about right. people. And 
once we started to read Thoreau and then we started to talk about it some more, then they kind of got like, well, maybe there is a reason why they're doing this. And maybe, you know, it, it doesn't always look pretty, you know, you know, civil disobedience isn't pretty, you know, it, it, it's, it's an ugly thing and often creates a really violent reaction, you know, so that was a big lesson too. That's, that's really interesting because exactly, I mean, and this is how it has been portrayed in the media is that it's very, um, you know, it, it, I mean, the, the camps in the states were all shut down under the, under the guise of, you know, hygiene regulations and up here in Toronto, we, they, we were moved out for the same reasons because um, of hygiene and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but it, it, I mean, this is, it is a messy process. And uh, I don't know if, if any of you have been to any of the general assemblies that are happening in your towns. If you haven't, I encourage you to just even just to check it out. Um, it's, yeah, it, it can be a pretty, it can be pretty messy in that there's a lot of opinions and take a long time, but a lot of stuff does, does happen and it's quite exciting to see. I happened to take three of my kids um, to New York and um, their their impression wasn't so much the messiness it was more and here's the big question what's the difference between occupy and walk i mean their their impression was more of because when we got there it had been going on for quite a while mm -hmm. and so it was more of okay you know you the point's been made what what do we do now you know mm -hmm. so that was just you know well, and, and on a long car ride home. <laughs> well, and this is it, and this is the conversation that all occupy, you know, that we're all having now is okay, you know, not that our point was made. It's it's that okay now what? And it's amazing some of the things that that are coming out of this. The the the, the initiatives in Toronto alone are pretty amazing, and even down in New York, some of the things that are, are happening, or, and then Occupy Homes out in Oakland. Yeah. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. transition. Um, mm -hmm. to, to, to sort of capture this spirit of, um, of civil disobedience and to, for people to say, hey, you know, this is, this is what's happening. And sort of to counter that, I, I, in my class, I, I wanted to really try, I, I do a lot of media, so I wanted to do media literacy stuff around this. And so I was showing um, the kids a lot of the videos that the New York General Assembly were putting out themselves. Um, and so there's a lot of great behind the scenes, really well produced videos that are out there on YouTube um, that show life in the camp and show, exa like, although the, they're being told how dirty it is or uh, in the media, how it's pretty clean. And, and mm -hmm. this speaks to, I think in the book you mentioned about how people in, are, instead of imagining a, a better world, they're actually working to create that better world. And there's a great video about uh, a per the permaculture movement in the park and what they did with their wastewater with from the dishes and how they f you filtered that through to create clean water to use the plants and they were growing their own food yeah. and this is a, this is a system they set up within two days and their whole idea was you know instead of just talking about this this beautiful world that we can create let's make it let's do it now and they did do it and so showing stuff like that to my kids really helped counter some of the images that they'd see when they'd go home and watch the news in the evening and, and just see in Toronto, it was, a mud, it was a park that, you know, got kind of muddy in, in, in New York. It was obviously down in, uh, in Zuccotti Park and there was a lot of, you know, also, you know, whatever they were trying to portray down there. So I think as teachers, um, using, all, you know, various sources of media can really help uh, frame this for kids in, or help them frame it in a more equitable way, definitely. I had also taken students, um, two different groups of students, into New York to um, Zuccotti Park and then to Wall Street. And the first time I went was the 19th of September, so it was two days after um, um, Occupy Wall Street began. And I think what um, students, these were um, senior um, high school students um, in the first case, what I think was most memorable um, for them was not Zuccot Zuccotti Park but rather when we walked down Wall Street. And at that time when you walked down Wall Street, you could not, um, you, you had to walk in single file. And, um, you know, there were barricades up, so everything was very restricted, uh, far more so than, you know, it, it, it had been ever before. And um, the levity that was part of Zuccotti Park was, you know, completely gone as we filed down um, Wall Street. And one of um, 
uh, of the students had a, um, a protest sign and um, was nervous enough by the police presence to put that down because it was a move along and, you know, don't look left, don't look right, just keep going. The second time I took students there was um, in, I guess it was, well, you know, I don't remember if it was October or November, but it was um, later. And these were art students. And um, as part of a, a trip we were on, uh, a group of us went, and they're all photographers. And, you know, I, what was interesting there is that there's a distance that happens when you're behind a lens. And they were looking at documenting more what was happening in, in Zuccotti Park mm -hmm. than, than anything else. So right. it was like just interesting, two very different kinds of experiences for, um, you know, high school students. Mm -hmm. in that. Marianne, can you say more about, um, I don't know, what the Occupy movement might learn from, uh, you know, the book and... and yeah. What, what's similar, what's not similar about the two? Sure. Well, you know, I'm thinking um, in the book, there, there's, a, there's a sense that you self-define problems, um, solutions within a lived space. So, um, you know, one of, the, um, one of the things missing in this book that is enormously present um, in the Occupy um, movement is that there is a counter narrative to the Occupy movement that is in fact not represented in this book. So when when we learn, well, I guess I shouldn't say that to some degree it's not represented. So we're learning about um, people who have walked out and it's really singularly their story we're hearing. I think one of the challenges in the Occupy movement is that one of the ways to control um, uh, horizontal, rhizomatic, grassroots groups is for a very powerful counter narrative to gain, um, you know, the populace ears. And, you know, I think to some degree, um, what could be learned from this book is how to resist that. Um, the section, um, um, Anna and Monica, what I'm thinking about is a section um, in, uh, in the opening of the book in Mexico where um, certainly, um, you know, there's a counter narrative um, to, to revolutionaries. Um, so I guess one of the, the takeaways that, you know, sort of off the top of my head, I, I would say is, you know, for people who are involved in the Occupy movements to not allow their narrative to be usurped by um, people who have other agendas. Um, and that just strikes me as being part of what, you know, if there's an underlying message, you know, in, in this book or, or, the, or similarities across the different places we visit, is that clearly local people, sort of like a Wendell Berry moment, right? Local people making local decisions right. um, instead of, you know, experts descending and trying to fix everything. And, and uh, boy, I hope that the Occupy groups resist um, celebrities, resist, the, you know, the people who want to come in and it then becomes all about them. Right. It's What's really that? funny that you, I'm sorry, that you no, no, go ahead. talk about that because when we, when we, with Ed Camp, it's it's all um, it's there's no conference feel to it. That means like there's no outside agencies there that are trying to control the situation, and it's it, you know it's simply teachers or administrators or whoever wants to be there. Parents, we had a couple bring their children to to the last one that we came to, but there's always a there's always a group of people that are going to stand up and say, you know, what's this all about? Whenever you create any kind of a movement or anything like that, you're mm -hmm. always going to get kickback. And, you know, we're starting to get some of that now because people are saying, you know, well, where are the experts? Where are, you know, where are the people that, you know, that know? <laughs> no, really. And it's interesting to see that because to me it's just funny that you're going to you're going to criticize people that are getting together on their own time to have fun and learn together you know so where's what's the big deal you know like well, who needs the experts you know what i mean like we're not we're not proposing to be anything other than what we are you know a group of teachers getting together to learn and that's but it causes 
it causes a, a dissonance for people. They don't understand it, you know. So it's yeah. I mean, that's totally, and that's not surprising at all. I mean, it's the way that we've been conditioned. We're we've always um, we're always being told that we need to go to the expert to get things done. I mean, just look at the TV that we watch, you know, shows like The Apprentice and stuff like that. Donald Trump is the expert when it comes to business. Um, and so it, that that's not a surprise to see that, definitely. And it's definitely, um, it's interesting to see because it, it, it really speaks to Marianne, what you were talking about, about other people um, not hijacking or, or the, um, the movement. And because what happens is quite a lot when people first sort of show up and I did this is you kind of show up and you're like okay who's in charge who do I got to talk to who's going to tell me what to do and then pretty soon after you've asked, asked about two or three people and they've all <laughs> looked at you and gone uh, no one's in charge and you suddenly figure out oh wow there really is no one in charge what we do is up to me I, if I have an idea to do something, then I can bring it forward and it, it can happen. So we have a saying here in Toronto, I don't know whether it's a, in other Occupy Squirts, um, if you have an idea, you've got to bottom line it. And I don't know where that comes from, if that's a business thing or what have you. But the idea is that if you want to suggest something or do something, then you've got to step up and make sure that it happens, that it is up to you to make sure that it gets done. Um, so. It, it, it really is, that's a really tough thing for people to work their head around. Or it was for me at first, because I was expecting, okay, who's going to lead us on the rally? Who's going to take us here? Who's going to be in charge? And only to find out that, oh, wow, people mm -hmm. are turning to me now for advice, and I'm, I'm suddenly answering questions. Um, and so I think um, this one of the great things about, about what's happening with this is that it sort of it breaks apart all those preconceived notions that we have about how these things work um, and so hopefully that will be a great strength in terms of the ongoing battle of the counter narrative that you speak of Marianne which is definitely happening right now um, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of other people trying mm -hmm. to tell tell the story of what this is all about sure. and we don't even know and the people who are involved in it don't even know what it's about you know fully <laughs> Our, our last four years, um, some of the things that we've really learned, um, you know, in this space that we've gotten to just be really free is um, when there are experts in the room, no matter if they are trying to overtake, just the fact that we've grown up knowing there's experts in the room, we squelch ourselves. Um, so I'm sure there's other people that have said this, but Deepak Chopra right. has uh, the hashtag of all by yourself. And um, that fits in, I think, with both um, the book, again, saying that when you realize no one is coming to help, I think of Sukhata Mitra, too. I think his success was that he would leave for three months. You know, and the whole idea of, and I think of Dan Meyer, now that you're here, and just, you know, less help is, is what is most beneficial when, especially as a mom, you think, you know, rush in and help, and that's probably not the best thing to do. I'm wondering if Fred can yeah, add thank some you. Yeah. communal experiences with us. Well, I, I immediately... Fred, Fred was in a commune for nine years. Yeah. Tell the story briefly, Fred. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about how um, having, uh, developing... Well, I, I, I went... Uh, I, I was hired to study the hippies in the summer of 1967 and lived in well? the Hague. Yes, very well. <laughs> and never never wrote a word about it, actually, until this uh, this story that's up on YouTube. Um, but it, it when I, uh, I left, my sister stayed and got involved with the diggers, and out of the diggers came the commune. And and it was really the, uh, the, the one of the first of the back to the land communes of the time. And I went to visit her when I came back uh, the, the next year and stayed nine years. Um, what are the diggers? And it's still a, a large part of my, uh, my community. The diggers were the political, uh, radical, anarchist, activist wing of the, of the hippies in San Francisco. 
Okay. They produced all the political broadsides and organized the free food in the park and the free store, and uh, they they were the uh, helped start the free clinic. Uh, they were the permaculture ones that were. They were. They were and and that's one of the. <laughs> well, they were. While they were preaching the the doctrine of anarchy, they in fact acted much more in the sort of old left vanguard um, notion. And I've been thinking about that contrast. That the old left had a, a a real conviction that there was a right way to do things that they saw, and they had to get out in front and lead. And then, if they were doing that properly, the masses would follow. And um, Occupy is really correcting that error in, in strategy, which obviously failed. Um, you know, we had various marginal cultural impacts, but no lasting change in the system. Um, and in fact, in many ways, we were six, very successful system. Um, so, you know, I, I do think in terms of the practice of day to day, how do you keep a movement going that is based on a leaderless um, model? It, it's a it's a great challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I felt like I learned that is still a useful lesson is developing a very high tolerance for ambiguity. <laughs> that is, there are times when you're trying to work through a group consensus process where you just have to say, well, no, this is not the time to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes that's extremely inconvenient, but that's the price you pay for wanting to uh, hear everyone's voice. Mm -hmm. You know, we were living in a very isolated um, place where if you were going to drive a truck to town, that was a big deal. And so if somebody said, well, no, I can't go this morning, I can't go till this afternoon because of da-da-da, you had to wait. And sometimes, <laughs> even then, you, mm. you couldn't get it together. Right. And people got very frustrated with <laughs> those kinds of, um, of impediments to what seemed quite straightforward to, to most people. But it only takes a few people to muddy things up to where, no, you can't really proceed in that direction if you really are going to keep to that principle of hearing every voice. Mm -hmm. um, Fred? This kind of fits with Peggy. Peggy's got a question for, good, good. Um, specifically for Liam, but anybody. Does that approach lead to lots of leaders with no followers? Yeah, I saw that in the chat, and I um, I answered it, but I, I'm happy to, to sort of say it again, is that it's quite quite interesting because when we when it said that it is a horizontal movement and there's no one leader um, but that's coupled with what I said before about people stepping up and uh, taking charge of stuff of things so what has happened is quite a lot of great ideas have been proposed and then nothing happens because either the person who proposed it wasn't willing to make sure it gets it done so we're learning here in Toronto that if you want something to happen and you're going to you, if you're going to propose it you better be ready <laughs> to back it up and do the work and it it's pretty amazing some of the things that have happened i mean we've organized you know we got a lot of local issues here that we're dealing with so we've organized speaking we've got a group that are speaking at city hall tomorrow um, over issues, we've already we've gone down. We've occupied um, the TTC, which is our transit system here. We're facing huge budget cuts and fare hikes. So we've so we've organized. Um, what we do is we're going on to the trains and we're holding uh, general assemblies on trains to discuss the fare hikes with people on trains. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things like that have been organized, and it's it's incredible what does get organized, um, even though there doesn't appear to be a single leader. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, you know, speaking to um, speaking to what Fred said about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about the ambiguity and patience is needed when you are committed to including all voices, and this is mm -hmm. the toughest thing. And as a teacher who's committed to social justice and equity, um, you know, in my classroom, when you get a, a group of fifty to hundred people together you know that just gets multiplied because you you really do need to sit and listen to everyone's everyone's opinion 
regardless how you feel about it. And that takes a long time. And mm -hmm. once you get over that uh, way, once again, I think we've been conditioned that we're so used to instant gratif uh, you know, satisfaction. Um, once you get over that, this is going to take a while, you know, you'll get there. And when we get like, when we've had disagreements and then achieved a consensus on a proposal, it's pretty amazing. To, to, we all just look around and you just say, wow, we can't believe we worked that out. And everyone feels included. And, you know, that's, if that's not the goal, then I don't know what is. Scott, Scott has a question. Go ahead. <laughs> can't hear you. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I put it in the chat. Um, Peggy wants to know, will those things be... <laughs> Hello, hello. How about now? Right. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Peggy asked, "Will those things get organized and be sustained, or, or will they will they fade away in a few months?" I don't know. Talk to me in a few months. <laughs> That's part of the comfort with their resolution, right? And living each day. And I also, I mean, we've got to question ourselves about what we think a leader is too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have this thought, I mean, a lot of us. And so we can't visualize everyone being a leader, but like our mantra is be you, and that's the best way to change the world. And that kind of goes like with, along with occupy yourself. It's completely different than a selfish mindset. Um, but that kind of a leader is also a follower, you know? So it's, you know, if I think, I think one thing that's missing in a lot of the things that are going on is this soul peace or this inner calm so that we aren't going after defense or mm -hmm. ego or, you know, we, we aren't ugly because <laughs> we, we can all be ugly if we don't have that um, calm. So I think the, the idea of each one of us being a leader is one of the best ideas because we're leading, you know, leading ourselves and realizing that no one is coming to help us. So we've got to, like you said, step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we don't have, um, if the language we use is just highly problematic. You know, the whole construct of the, the binary of leader and follower. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once we start to have, and, and, and I'm not suggesting that there aren't emerging moments where people um, take active roles that resemble leaders or resemble followers but it's the dichotomy of um, in, in our culture it often looks like someone is a leader as if like their whole life is situated as that's all they ever do uh, and of course that's absurd I mean nobody could sustain that level of, of, um, of action um, I mean, you, you would have to have other fallbacks uh, just simply to be able to live. But we've created sort of this little story that says there are leaders and, and there are followers. There are experts and there are non-experts. You know, the whole duality of, um, seems to be really problematic. Um, even the, the question that was just asked about where, where will this go in three months? Will it be present or will it be faded out? All of that is part of the same narrative that says mm -hmm. things are simply this way or that way. Exactly. And I, yeah. Sorry. No, 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 I, no, I agree completely, Marianne. You're, you're, you're completely, I mean, I think you and I are on the same page with this, is that questions like that and, you know, are part of that frame that we are just so used to operating in that to think outside of it is either not possible or it's seen as failure. So with, with regards to the leader aspect of it, I mean, that's not really a huge concern because right now, you know, Occupy is not, I mean, you've seen what it's doing. It's right now, like the, the latest action, I'll go back to Occupy Oakland. They're in there fighting mm -hmm. against people who, who are wrongfully being foreclosed on their homes. Yeah. Now, does that require a leader? Does it require a, a, a you know some one focal person? Apparently not, because they're doing it, and mm -hmm. there's no leader, um, you know. And then so so Peggy, I, I apologize that I was kind of flippant with 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 your question about will it last, and you know that's not a real answer. Um, oh, but the, hold on now, I thought that was an excellent answer. Okay, well okay, well no, but I I but I, I did. Like that. 
Well, I think it needs. Well, okay, but I think it does need. It does need some. Res uh, I, I, I can. I can. I hope to offer a, a better answer or a more respectful answer. Um, in that, even though while I do feel that it's a question that is within that frame, um, just to sort of knock down the frame is to look at, you know, will these things last? Well. It, I don't know, nobody knows, but what we have accomplished already is particularly down in the United States, um, you, you know, occupied down there, is they've changed the conversation. You know, mm -hmm. suddenly we're talking about these sorts of things. Right. And the only people that I see who aren't talking about these things are, are your presidential candidates. And <laughs> for, for, personally for me, that, that race won't get interesting until they start talking about it. But the conversation seems to have changed and that alone is a pretty big achievement. Um, so, and I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. Okay, you're good. You didn't change the answer I was hearing. That okay, I don't good, know. good, good, we, good. We need to say, I don't know more. Yeah. I mean, why do we yeah. have to have answers? Exactly, well, I, exactly. Somebody, well, just, somebody just said that to us when we were talking in the Ed Chat the other night on uh, Twitter. Somebody had, I wasn't in there, but somebody had said, you know, do you think Ed Camp is just a fad? And who knows? Maybe it is, but you know, you if you don't control something, if it's if it's controlling itself, that's the way it should be. You shouldn't know, because once somebody steps in and controls it, then it's not what it was. Mm -hmm. You know. And what not, is a fad? Is a fad a step? Is it you right. know? Right. What is a fad anyway? Like like Liam said, it gets the conversation going. You know, it exactly. it, it shows that people can step up and be what they need to be at a time when they need to do that. Mm -hmm. And they could be anybody. It doesn't matter who it is, you know, and that's great message for our kids. You know, you, it doesn't take somebody who's this perfect, you know, CEO of a company to do something. It, it could be you. And that's one of the things that Thoreau says, you know, is one man, one honest mm -hmm. man stepping forward and, in, you know, impacting the world which is what Gandhi did with his message, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it just is really interesting. It's such a great message for kids to see that live in their own lifetime mm -hmm. that it, they could be that, you know, instead of everything else that they're supposed to be, you know? Or maybe even that they already are that. Right. You know, I mean, part of, maybe part of a, a healthy counter narrative is to say that, you know, for systems that are always emerging, the the questions have to really change right. you know predictability is, is is a fallacy so it's you know it's no longer even necessarily interesting to keep asking you know right. what will be um and, and that you know the the idea that you are enough where you are because you simply are there right um is powerful i mean i think the most powerful message coming out of the occupy uh, movements is that ordinary people matter mm -hmm. Yep. And, and collectively, ordinary people may in fact be more powerful in, um, in the ways they organize right. um, than the people who, quite frankly, hold you know, the financial power, right. political power, um, at, at least in this country. I won't yep. speak for Canada, but here in the United States, <laughs> <laughs> it seems pretty clear. <laughs> I think that's a huge message for all of us to you being you, whatever degree you are, mm -hmm. is uh, Steve Jobs, one of the videos that he doesn't even look like himself because it was so long ago, came out and he's talking about everything that's happened has happened by people that are no smarter than you, mm -hmm. you know, and just the idea, like yeah. Marianne, <laughs> that I love the whole idea that today, right now, you're, you're valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we would all start at that place, if we would call a halt to everything and start tomorrow morning and everybody believes that everyone's valuable, we could get so much done. I mean, we wouldn't be playing all these policy and defense and mistrust and distrust. And it looks like we have a youth right yeah. here. Among Scott, who's that? <laughs> she needs to talk or we won't see it. Hi. Hi. This is the teacher Hello. conference. Tell us, tell us why you want to move to a big city. Because there are protests there, and we live in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Get involved in it. Cool. Well, well, hey, you can start your own Occupy. It doesn't have to be in a big city. You have a tent. Yeah, you have <laughs> a tent. We've got. That's what seems to be happening up here. Is um, 
now that uh, we've sort of been all swept out of the parks uh, across Canada, is so, now we've got a lot of the smaller towns are are saying that they're doing it and all they're doing is they're just having general assemblies at, at, in the evening mm. and one is a town called Peterborough which is a couple hours outside of here not a very big town but they've uh, they've announced that they're going to start doing that as well and it's it's just a simply a, you know I think it's a new way of showing that you're not happy is just going out and you know taking up space even for a short amount of time so I, I agree you know you can, you can start them wherever you want Pick a small or you problem. could show that you are happy, right? <laughs> Kelsey, start a protest there showing that you are happy. That's right. Showing the great things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's been a lot of sort of what I want to call macro talk, and, but I've been trying to think micro. And Liam, could you start us off a little bit about what you actually did in your classroom? You brought okay. general assemblies into your classroom. Um, yeah. Now that was so. The way that worked, as I mentioned, we were studying government uh, as part of our grade five social studies unit. So that's you know learning all about uh, parties and the political system. And we actually had a local election, so we followed that, and mm -hmm. and that was a lot of fun. Um, but also part of the. Um, part of what we study is also how parliament works. We have parliament up here in Canada. So it's basically how the how they all sit around and they talk to each other and who the speaker of the house and all these sorts of rules. And um, essentially a general assembly is the original form of, of, you have a parliament type of talk. Um, and the great thing about the hand signals is that it's designed to well, the entire space before we start our general assemblies we make sure that everyone knows that it's in a non-oppressive space so there's no there's no sexist no homophobic language to be spoken or any other um, oppressive language and we also we also recognize um, many other things and so part of that is the hand signals which allow people to um, to communicate so it was one night while I was at the general assembly I just thought this would be brilliant for my classroom because what these hand signals do is they stop people with louder voices um, from dominating the conversation and then they allow people who maybe don't want to speak up and to draw attention to themselves but allow them to um, show physically how they're feeling about something so I don't know if you know them you twinkle your fingers if you think something's good you do that if you think you're not disagree and there's a whole bunch of them mm -hmm. and so one day uh, we had talked about Occupy, I had shown them some, some, some of the videos that were produced and so I talked to, we showed them the General Assembly video and um, they loved it, they absolutely loved it and they, so they immediately, so we immediately started doing the fingers and as I said in my blog post, that the goal of the lesson was just to sort of show other ways of communicating and that was it, I didn't plan to have it carry on but the kids themselves kept it going. So like when I was doing my math lesson and I was checking to see if, if the kids got the long division questions, instead of seeing, you know, shaking of heads or anything, I saw a couple of these and I saw a couple of these and I was like, oh, okay, great. And they started doing it themselves. So it was, it was quite an amazing, it was so much fun. And it's so much fun that I had to blog about it. Uh, but I think it, that speaks to just how, how natural what a natural and what a, a what a how we're all longing for non-oppressive spaces and if we have them everyone feels welcome in them so um yeah so it's it's a lot of fun do you have a video of that do you know what i wish i did i don't have a video of it um <laughs> because i don't really video the kids but i wish i did but what I um, what I am putting together, or we're putting together with um, with the Occupy group, is some teacher guides to sort of show teachers um, how to introduce that into their classroom, and that's something we're hoping to maybe have um, available on, up on our Occupy Toronto site. In well, it'll be a couple. It won't, it won't be till the new year for sure. And what I'm hoping is that it goes beyond just. Well, I don't know if it's just there. I, I don't want to judge that, but. Like, mm -hmm. if if kids can be part of deciding what's next in the classroom, so that oh, our classrooms sure. become systems of evolving, oh. you know. Go ahead. I would. 
Yeah, no, I would love that. I mean, I try to I try to do my teaching as student student driven as I can. Um, and I mean, as you know, we have got standards that we have to touch on in order to report. But um, definitely um, having I would love that as well. Having the kids at the beginning of the year, you know or even just beginning of a unit and we do that a lot having you know what would you like to study about that so I try to do that but definitely um, bringing in this whole consensus um, aspect of it would definitely help make that happen for sure and see I got a question what do you do I'm just reading Peggy's question what do you do oh. when it's time to vote and you don't like support any candidates <laughs> So, Peggy, is that a question for me or for general? I'm reading it in the chat. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> we can okay. just leave, we'll leave that it as there. a question. Sorry. That's fine. I think Fred, uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, you, have you been thinking anything, or we're we're kind of getting around to last thoughts well, for I for tonight? Everybody, keep reading the book, and we'll come back to this. Um, with with Deborah Freeze um, as soon as she's available on a Wednesday evening. But last thoughts for tonight, Fred. We'll start with you, <laughs> if you don't mind. I, I there was a uh, there was a an interesting um, interview with somebody from Occupy San Francisco, which got evicted at one thirty in the morning um, this morning about what they were going to do next. And uh, one of the things that had happened to them in the negotiations with the city was they were offered a place in another part of the city called the Mission District. And uh, it, the, basically the negotiations broke down so it never went anywhere. But what the fellow being interviewed said was after that all fell apart, he realized actually it was really a good thing that it fell apart because the whole thing was being done in a discussion between the city and the leaders of the Occupy, which is in downtown San Francisco, and nobody on either side thought, well, no, wait a minute, if we're talking about moving to some other part of the city, we better talk to the people who are local to that part of the city. And <laughs> neither side had done that. Mm. So I just thought that was an interesting little tie back to your Keeping it local, it's you know, it's easy to get slipped back into the old ways of power people and leaders doing this and that, and forgetting that wait a minute, you've got to follow every step along the way if you really are going to follow this kind of principle. Mm. Liam, your last thoughts this evening. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, my last thoughts. Well, I mean, my last thoughts are, I mean, I came into the discussion not knowing too much about this, about the book, but it sounds quite fascinating. Um, and I definitely do now see, Paul, what you were thinking when you talked about the connections between the book and Occupy. Um, mm -hmm. I just think it's, in general, um, it's, it's something that definitely occupies something that teachers should look at, um, it, you know, and if they can come to their own conclusions, but it's driven by a, a need for social justice and greater equity in our society. And personally, my view of teaching is, is that should be at the heart of their all teaching. Um, and I think it's, uh, I just think it's uh, something that uh, needs to be reflected on. But thank you so much for having me tonight. Liam, take a minute to um, promote your your other side of yourself, your, okay. your authorship. Oh, well, thank you, Paul. I will indeed. Well, yes, in addition to being a teacher, I'm also uh, a writer um, and an author of, of kids' books as well. And so if you go to my website, liamodonald.com, um, you can see all the books I've written. I write graphic novels um, for kids, and a lot of them dealing with the issues that we're talking about um, about media and about government um, and and those sorts of things. So, yes, feel free to check it out. LeonOdonnell.com. We need a we Great need Christmas a good Gilbert. we need a good graphic novel about Occupy, don't we? Well, we do actually. 
We do indeed. And there's actually there's a guy here in Toronto, uh, one of one of the one of the crew who's uh, who's actually working on something right now. He's sketching it all out. So I, I there's going to be a lot of stuff uh, put out uh, uh, just around this. I, I think, as I said, it's just beginning. Um, we don't know where it's going, but uh, you know it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Cool. Mar Marianne, any last thoughts this evening? Um, no, I have no lot, none. Good. <laughs> no last thoughts. Um, you know, I'm just still back at the idea that Deborah might be joining us at some time, and uh -huh. um, really excited mm -hmm. to 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 listen and, and interact with her mm -hmm. because she's really the person in the book who's been out there working with others and learning and is a translator in some ways, you know, and um, I think that's, you know, I, I decided to walk out of my job and after 28 years in public education and um, I'm right at that comma where I'm not sure where I'm going next and so, you know, but, but she interests me. So, <laughs> so once you said that, Paul, my head has been um, mm. just really curious to interact with her and and um, everyone else in the group this has been wonderful thank you so much thank Enjoyed you it. Anne, let's come up to you um, Any uh, you know i love this book i can't wait to meet the author either i can't wait to talk to her i love the way she writes she just makes me want to be in the place where she is mm -hmm. um and i really want to hook up with liam because i want his kids to teach my kids the twinkle fingers or whatever you call them <laughs> and I want that I would really like them to have a discussion about the Occupy movement since you're so involved in it um, and they can see it you know you know close up but I would like them to see that it's not just here mm. and that other children are involved in you know mm -hmm. learning about it too so I'd love to hook up with you okay definitely well we'll keep in touch okay thank Scott. you for this no I had a great time Scott. Yeah, no, this was great. Thank you. Your daughter, any last thoughts there? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Good. To go along with Liam's student-based learning, we did something in social studies. It was like a tic-tac-toe board. Mm -hmm. and, uh, nice. <laughs> the top row was mapping, and each row had something to do. It, they all had something in common. And you got to pick whatever you did and turn that in. Ah, so you could—you didn't have to turn Very everything good. in. Cool. So you enjoyed that choice, I bet. I did. Yeah. Excellent. It's all about choice, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. I mean, even as adults, we like choice. I, mean, I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> At least give me two yeah. things to choose from. Speaking of that choice. And speaking of walking and speaking of occupying, I would like to urge us all to try to um, talk about spaces other than classrooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I hear that, Monica, but I also think that it's possible to transform within classrooms as well. Um, so I think, you know, I think both again and, and i think the book kind of supports both yeah well go ahead i agree if, if you go yeah. to that classroom for choice i think that's all the difference i don't think we have to disband any classrooms mm -hmm. i i think there's also other magical spaces that we're missing out on in our cities um, right it doesn't have to be either or yeah exactly it can be both and mm -hmm. but the, we're we're talking about this whole walk out, walk on, and occupy, and we're not giving our kids choices. So we're, we're perpetuating it. We are. And they will walk out at a point. I mean, the <laughs> alternatives that are available already mm -hmm. and, and will continue to become available um, will allow some students, not all, um, but especially some students who probably have some, some means and, and some levels of support to make alternative choices to traditional school. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's already here. Uh, I can't imagine high schools are going to be existing a decade from now in ways they are now. Right. 
And I, th I think the title of the book comes from an Indian educational group where they started talking about not dropouts, but walkouts. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, thinking about students that way is a, an important thing to do. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to respect each other's time and wrap up here. <laughs> Thank you all for a very rich Thanks, conversation. Guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and you. come back. <laughs> We're going to continue talking about all this, um, and we'll let you know when exactly. Um, okay. We'll be continuing. I do want to say um, a thank you to Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo at edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net, um, and uh, where you can find some of this. Okay. Now we should all do this. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. There you go. Yeah. Have to, there we go. Have to get over basic embarrassment. I don't know. No. <laughs> okay. I know. Good night, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night.